Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome to this side video. This commentary, I suppose, is the correct term we shall use um, for my Starship Troopers The Mobile Infantry Lord video, where, as promised, we are going to be talking about some of the sillier and less serious aspects of Starship Troopers. Um, and, as this is particularly in relation to the 1997 movie, there are plenty of silly things in that movie, which, to be fair, is hardly a surprise considering that the director of the movie, Paul Verhoeven, didn't even finish the novel. Instead, supposedly, handing it over to his writing staff and going, make me a political satire of fascism from this. To which I'm sure the writing team responded, all blue-eyed and bushy-tailed, yes sir, we'll certainly do that. Then they sat down, read the thing and went, <laughs> how? how are we going to make a satire of fascism from this? And the answer to that question was apparently, dress them all up in grey uniforms, give a few of them storm coats, and <laughs> paint an eagle on a flag. <laughs> there you go. Nazism all the way. Uh, to be fair, though, to be fair... See, really, this demonstrates one of the points I made in my Is the Imperium Fascist relating to 40k, where my conclusion was, no, it is far too simple of a take to call the Imperium Fascist. One of the first points I brought up is like, why do people think it's fascist? Well, it's because of the iconography, it's because of the style and the visual presentation. And Starship Troopers is that in buckets and spades. People look at Starship Troopers, they see the visuals, they see the designs of the uniforms, they see the flag, they see the aesthetics, the feel of the officer class and so on, and they think... That looks an awful lot like Nazis. Therefore, this must be about the Nazis, yes? Except, of course, again, when you start looking into the political system, you quickly realize that, hold on a second, you, you, you have to volunteer for federal service? The state has no power over you unless you volunteer? That doesn't sound an awful lot like fascism. Hold on, are schools occupied by teachers who discourage you from federal service? What? what? And, and these news broadcasts, yeah, sure, they're overblown, but they all tell the truth. A hundred thousand dead in an hour. <laughs> Can you imagine the Germans going like, ah, uh, yeah, today on the Eastern Front we lost about half a million men in Stalingrad. It is looking großstark, meine Kameraden. <laughs> Of course not. And the Sky Marshal, the highest military official within the Federation, stepping down after making a mistake. Yeah, Hitler just tucks his little hat underneath his arm and goes, Ah, yes, invading Russia in winter was a mistake. Sorry. <laughs> and just, <laughs> just leaves. <laughs> I mean, it'd be funny, but no, that does not indeed seem like fascism. And before I get too far off the point of this video, talking about the silliness of the 1997 movie and the mobile infantry, I'll wrap it up by simply saying this. Visual suggestion and iconography has a big impact on how we perceive a thing. And when the opposite of that thing is actually relatively deep political commentary, as in the form of Starship Troopers, it is very easy for the immediate audience, the surface level viewer, to not take that in anywhere near as readily as they'll take in the giant eagle painted on the Federation flag, you know? And in this particular topic as well, it gets even more complicated because fascism is an incredibly ill-defined political philosophy. As again, I learned making the Is the Imperium Fascist video. Nobody really can define fascism. There are over 20 different definitions of fascism on Wikipedia. Over 20 different definitions. That should give you some idea. And again, to be fair, it is because fascism as a political ideology was intentionally created to be extremely flexible. It was intended to be simply whatever the dictator wanted it to be at that given point in time. 
And that is also why I defined fascism in the way that Mussolini did. Everything in the state, nothing against the state, nothing outside the state. And the Terran Federation in Starship Troopers, whether it be in the book or the movie, does not fit that description. And so Paul Verhoeven managed to create a brilliant masterpiece in Starship Troopers almost entirely by, well, accident. <laughs> it's pretty hilarious when you come to think of it, but there were some pieces in which um, accident was perhaps less brilliant. The Morita assault rifle being the foremost one amongst them. In my law video, I, I, I did basically what I would refer to as apologia for the Morita assault rifle. Because it is true, if you are going to be fighting a war against bugs, you are going to want a big old gun. Just a warrior bug weighs in at 500 kilograms. And as Carl so brilliantly put it, if you blow off a limb, it's still 86% combat effective. This is a big, fast, and incredibly lethal construct that doesn't give even the most flying irrelevant fuck about getting shot at, about getting injured, wounded, or killed. It cannot feel fear. It will never cower. It will never retreat. It will never stop trying to kill you. When you're up against something like that, you want stopping power and nothing but. And when you add in then also that these bugs are actually fairly heavily armoured to the point like small arms rounds like 5.56s five, or less would probably bounce off or only do superficial damage, yeah, you need an oversized 7.62 to reliably punch through that. And as we see in one of the early um, scenes in the Starship Troopers movie as well, they're handing out uh, ammunition, and you can see it has an oversized projectile, a black-tipped oversized projectile. Now, that usually means armor-piercing, and again, since we know the bugs are heavily armored, it makes a degree of sense that you would be using big armor-piercing ammunition with a super-long overblown barrel to ensure you get the maximum muscle velocity and the maximum kinetic energy out of that projectile. What doesn't make sense, however, is the fact that this huge gun barely produces any recoil whatsoever to the point where it can be fired comfortably from the hip. Now again, in the law video, I made the excuse that presumably there's some kind of you know, recoil dampening device in the barrel, because surely if they've got technology to make spaceships, they probably have technology to do that as well, and again, that would be the only logical conclusion, or of course, the director and the designers simply didn't think about that. Another one too, no aiming device. <laughs> what? N not even like iron sights or anything? <laughs> how, how do you aim the damn things? And again, I ran some apologia there because there is an interpretation of this that is reasonably understandable. If you're going to be fighting warrior bugs, if you're going to be fighting hordes of arachnids, usually at like 10 meters range or closer, you don't really need to aim, do you? And if you're fighting them at longer range, then they're going to be coming in waves. And again, you don't really need to aim. In fact, aiming in that kind of situation is probably going to be counterproductive because you're going to tunnel in on a target. You're going to waste time taking aim and trying to hit precisely. When you're fighting a, again, 500 kilogram unstoppable warrior bug, you don't have the time to do that. You are far better off simply just hammering it with rounds and shooting in the general direction of the nerve stem instead of trying to pick them off individually. And of course, at long range again, you're not really supposed to be aiming at these things. It's a waste of time. Hitting the nerve stem is going to be difficult enough at 10 meters against a super fast and agile opponent, never mind at 200 meters or a kilometer, etc. But 
there should be some aiming system. I mean, hell, there, there does appear to be some tactical helmets with what appears to be visors with heads-up displays. That would absolutely be some kind of tech that they would have access to, and which would be super, super useful, particularly at point-blank range, since you will be able to maintain the tactically advantageous wide field of view, being able to take in all of the emergent threats as they're coming at you, whilst also being able to see, right, my gun is now pointed there and specifically there. So if I pull the trigger, I am going to hit that area. That would be great. Or even just something like a simple reflex sight mounted in the rear end of the bullpup carry system, for example. That would do plenty as well, because, again, some, again, most cases, you don't want to be aiming these weapons against this kind of an enemy. But occasionally you might want to, if you're up against a tanker bug, for example. Now, we know that the Morita can penetrate its armored shell, although only after sustained fire. But it's got a big, it's got big ass eyes! And those tiny little antennas that fire off the whooshy fire, it could shoot those. Absolutely you can shoot those. Now, shooting them and hitting them from the hip, probably not, but even just a basic reflex sight and suddenly those eyes, the antenna, the mouth, etc, all of the squishy bits, the joints, all of those become eminently exploitable weak points. And it doesn't even end there, as far as the Morita is concerned, not by a long stretch. Then there's the ammunition capacity. 160 rounds! of 762 in the internal magazine of that rifle no <laughs> no there is no way you fit 160 rounds in that gun no bloody way no way and they're carrying two spare mags of this as well that means that each individual trooper carries 480 rounds of ammunition jesus that's, that's, that's quite a lot of ammo to be lugging around. Now again, considering the enemy that they are fighting, that is probably also absolutely necessary, but also essentially physically impossible. Oh well, I I'm probably overstating it when I say physically impossible, but to give you an idea, the American M60 machine gun comes with, what is it, a hundred round box magazine with a belt feeding into the weapon itself. The Morita is as big and bulky, indeed it appears to be even bigger and bulkier than the M60, which already weighs in at 11 kilos, and the mobile infantryman is expected to carry just under five times the ammunition capacity of the M60. 480 rounds of ammunition in addition to a weapon that, let's be generous and assume it weighs the same despite being bulkier, you know, future materials, etc. 11 kilograms. And then you add on the armor, of course, on top of that. <laughs> Mobile infantry kit is hefty. And again, of course, that's before we take into consideration all of the other things an infantry might be asked to carry. You know, water canteens, food, supplies, field kit, blah blah blah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound overly comfortable. But at the same time, it's also necessary. You need a lot of ammunition to deal with the arachnids. What I would probably do is, for every fire team of five men, I would have a sixth man be a designated ammo humper, basically. Equipped with some kind of rudimentary exoskeleton. We already have those in development right now. Or maybe even a robot to do the job. Now, that's more difficult in rough terrain, but assume you've got a sixth mobile infantryman with a light exoskeleton the harness that allows him to carry a much heavier load. Give him a ginormous backpack, hell, give him two or three, and load them up to the brim with rounds. And that would give each fire team a massively increased amount of ammunition. Which again, is absolutely necessary considering the opposition. And then there's the live firing course. Oh, the live firing course. <laughs> Even when I watched this movie as a kid, I was like, hold on. That seems like a safety concern. And yes, yes, it absolutely is. All right, so 
I'm not going to use any reference material throughout this video, as you probably already noticed, and that's because there is some, you know, copyright stuff here. Now, the copyright holders of Starship Troopers, the movie, were very nice and very cooperative, and they released the lock on it, because it's an automated system, you know, YouTube checks it, it goes like, ah, copyright, and then it locks it, and then I sent in the dispute, and they immediately went like, yeah, no, totally, this is, this is fine, not a problem. And they unlocked it immediately, no wait time whatsoever, like, really good guys, but... In stuff like this, I want this to be, you know, my stuff uniquely, which is why I've got this beautiful artwork here in the background. But if you watch the movie, you will know the scene I am talking about. They've got the assault course. Now, at first I was thinking, hmm, the charitable interpretation of this, which is what I've given the Morita in the lore video, is that maybe they're using underpowered rounds, and they're so confident in the armor's ability to stop one of these rounds that they're willing to run it like this. All right, okay, maybe. Now again, underpowered rounds would be the key there, because later on in the movie we see the Morita's uh, rounds just slam straight through body armor, even at long distances without one guy who got snatched up by the flying bug, for example. But with underpowered rounds, maybe, maybe, it would still be hilariously unresponsive, because of course, their armor isn't full body coverage. But even if we take that into consideration, there's no cover. There's no covers. There, there's no backstop. There are people. There, there's dudes standing in an elevated tower downrange on the assault course. There are dudes running laps a couple dozen meters away, completely unarmored. Any stray round in any direction of this course is likely to catch someone in the nuts. <laughs> it's, it's so stupid. It is, it is so, so stupid. Uh, you could kind of argue as well that, you know, here's the thing. If this assault course was properly protected, you know, there were round stoppers to the sides and to the ends, etc. So there was no way that a, a stray round would shoot off the course and hit somebody training somewhere else or an observer in the tower. Then I might say, okay, the mobile infantry is harsh, really harsh, and medical technology is super advanced. So maybe they're like, okay, we're going to make this super realistic. If you get shot by a stray round in the leg, well, you're not going to die. We can fix you up and that'll teach you a bloody valuable lesson. And your teammate too, who fired that round, you know, don't do that. Ricochets are dangerous. Maybe, maybe. But <laughs> when you're endangering the entire camp surrounding the assault course too, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the the mobile infantry doesn't have that many recruits, I think. Later on, they even complain like, oh, the the um, assault range incident has already cost us a couple of recruits, showing also that they do value their recruits. I just don't think they would take this kind of a risk this liberally. But, of course, what probably happened was that the director set this up, didn't really have a whole lot of military personnel on site, or they simply didn't think about it, and in terms of, you know, shooting it, and they didn't set up uh, round stoppers. Yeah, entirely possible. Or maybe they just didn't have the budget for it, or maybe they thought it looked, you know, shitty or whatever. It's entirely possible. There we are. Now, now we've ragged on the Morita for a while, haven't we? Ah, oh, the poor Morita. Like, the Morita is a really, really beautiful gun. It looks cool. And it, it looks futuristic too. And in many ways, the Morita does make sense. But boy, there, there, there is a lot of silly things about the Morita. A lot of silly, silly things. Oh, oh, never mind. The shotgun too. The shotgun. <laughs> Now, the shotgun seems to actually be fairly effective, and it would be as well. A shotgun against a warrior bug, again, presuming they're using ultra-dense pellets. Yeah, that would wreck some ass, absolutely. You fire that thing at five meters against a charging warrior, oh yeah, that's a lot of stopping power. That's a lot of stopping power. And the movie demonstrates that. You see them blowing off the warrior's uh, mandibles. You see them blowing huge holes in the nerve stem and so on. If anything, the mobile infantry should be used, uh, should be trained to use it more. Now, again, <laughs> there is no way on God's good green earth that thing contains 16 <laughs> shotgun rounds. But oh well, details. Oh, and that leads me to, uh, 
Now, why a shotgun? Considering the, the, the style of the enemy, it seems natural, right? You know, they come up close, you blast them with a shotgun. Okay. But surely a grenade launcher would be even better. At the very least, having a grenade launcher in the squad. They've got hand grenades too, which are clearly made out of plastic, hilariously so. Which they never use. You'd think that would be an excellent weapon against the bugs, right? You should even have maybe a grenadier whose, whose sole duty is to carry... The Morita, maybe like one um, ammunition pack, and then he gets any additional ammo from the bearer. And his job is just to lob grenades, because surely that would be devastating against the huge packed hordes of warriors. And considering, again, the grenades are powerful enough to blow a bloody chunk out of a tanker bug... Yeah, th those are those are pretty good grenades, and even more so, they've probably also got a fair bit of a safety radius. Now, the problem with fragmentation grenades is those fragments they 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 fly out fast and fly out pretty damn far, meaning that grenades can be a bit of a threat to your own squad as well if you're not at a sufficient distance or if you're not throwing them into a room or something. But in the case of Starship Troopers, they seem to be explosive grenades where the killing power comes from the force of the explosion itself rather than necessarily the fragmentations, um, a la the German potato mashers, for example. In that case, throwing them out would have a much smaller lethal radius for the humans. And again, when you're expecting to deploy these at pretty damn close quarters, that would be vital. In fact, fragmentations would probably be a bad thing in a hand grenade designed to fight against the bugs. Also, the fragmentations, all right, that's going to be lethal against a human, but against a 500 kilogram heavily armored warrior bug? Ah, uh, probably less so. You probably want sheer explosive force to just pulp the bug's innards more than anything. And once we're on the topic of weaponry, let's also give an honourable mention to the idea of tanks and bombers and power armoured mech suits and all of that, shall we? After all, if they're going to war in spaceships, you'd think they'd at least have tanks, right? Well... In all due fairness, again, there is an in-universe explanation for why they don't have tanks, and also a movie reason as well. The movie reason is simple. Expensive. <laughs> simple as that. The uh, the dropship, too, that they made, that's a real dropship. That's a actual big functional... Oh, well, functional, it doesn't fly, but, you know, it's a big functional real-life thing. And it cost a lot to make. And so they couldn't really do anything about the tanks. They didn't have the budget to hire in, like, actual tanks or convert them or build them, etc. Same reason why they didn't do power armor, too, by the way. Simply didn't have the budget for it, really. But yes, the tanks. The reason why tanks would probably be of somewhat questionable usage to the mobile infantry is because they are invading worlds with... No infrastructure, at the very least, no infrastructure usable by humans. The bugs in their massive subterranean warrens have great big tunnels and so on, but they're all quite uneven. They are traversed by creatures with many, many limbs and many legs, more importantly, and they don't need the kind of uniformity of terrain that we use and prefer. There's no real reason for them to make nice flat fields for us to walk and drive over. And so most of these planets is covered in nigh-on impassable terrain. Now for a tank, that's a big problem, because tanks rely on relatively decent terrain to make good speed. Now they can cross some pretty unhospitable land, but this comes at a cost of fuel usage, of material wear and tear, and so on. Tanks probably would be more of an impediment than a help in many situations for the mobile infantry. If anything, they could really use some bunker-like things that could be shot down from orbit, for example. Fix the defensive positions, perhaps with a hint of mobility would be useful. Uh, maybe some armoured cars or buggies carrying heavy weaponry could be worth something. But again, difficult terrain all around. This is somewhat fixed later on, uh, both in the CGI movies and in Marauder, with the idea of mech suits. 
Now that's a much better idea because presuming you've got all of the hyper advanced software and actuators required to have a walking mech suit capable of traversing practically any and all terrain, well, now you've got a good way of carrying much heavier weaponry and way more ammunition in roughly the same terrain as an infantryman can cross, right? Good, now we're getting somewhere. And particularly with the idea of jetpack infantry. But then we also kind of go back again. Where you see the heavy mech suits, and then in the animated movies, you see each individual mobile infantryman essentially having a light suit of not particularly heavily armored power armor. In that case, the power arm is actually way more useful because it has a jump pack, allowing the mobile infantry to become truly mobile while still carrying a nice, big, hefty small arms rifle and also additional mounts for missile weapons and heavy weapons like miniguns as well. Now that would be a hell of a lot more useful than pretty much anything else because, once more, the bugs. One's weapon must necessarily be constrained by the capabilities and the weaknesses of one's enemies. And in the case of the bugs, your best defense is going to be maneuverability. There's a hell of a lot more of them, they are going to be a hell of a lot faster than a normal man on foot, and this means that they can easily surround positions, they can outmaneuver you, they can outflank you, and they can pin you into position by simply throwing hordes of troops at you. In those circumstances, the ability to kick in a jetpack and just fucking leave is of course invaluable. And on the point of maneuverability, you'd think that again the bombers be really useful. We even saw those in the 1997 movie where they glassed a whole horde of the little arachnids. That seems good. Why weren't they using that at Clendathu? Well, that actually does have an explanation, namely that they arrived in orbit, they deployed the mobile infantry, and within 30 minutes literally everything had gone to hell in a handbasket. And the fleet was getting pounded into oblivion by bug anti-orbital weaponry. <laughs> That's the problem, isn't it? Like, hmm, all of our bombers are situated on these massive ships that are currently being blasted into smithereens by weapons we barely even knew existed, and the mobile infantry is in a full-scale desperate retreat. <laughs> what do you bomb? <laughs> it's like, by the time you reach the surface, the battle's already moved on, and leaving the ship... At that point in time, when the ships are going kablooey, that'd be a dangerous thing in and of itself, so that's the reason why they weren't being used at Clendathu. But they were, of course, used later on at P, and to considerable effect. Now, there is a problem with this again, however. These are all orbital-based bombers, which means they gotta spend quite a lot of time entering the atmosphere and then escaping the atmosphere again at the end of a run. This probably also means that their operational time in any given area is very short, because entering into the atmosphere, that's difficult enough in and of itself, and then once you've dropped your payload, you then need enough thrust energy to leave the atmosphere again. Have a look at the space shuttles and how massive those things are, and you'll get a kind of general idea of the kind of energy required to bring something into orbit safely. On the bright side, however, being stationed in orbit means that the, you know, the ship can just chill out up there and go like, oh, you need help on the other side of the planet, right? Here we are, and deploy. Oh, you need help over there now? Deploy. And so on. That's, that's really handy. But the bugs are subterranean. So finding the bugs and bombing the bugs could actually be a really difficult thing. Often we see massive hordes of arachnids moving over land, and probably they have to do that occasionally, because of course they don't have tons everywhere. So the fleet's real golden window of our opportunity here is when the arachnids are moving to a target area, then the fleet needs to be in position, ready to deploy the bombers, to then hit them hard, and then get the hell out of there. Presumably, they would also have some sort of 
communication system embedded with the mobile infantry since we see radio operators with radio backpacks capable of reaching orbit. One would therefore presume that whoever has control of the radio would go like, okay, we're moving in this direction. We're here. We're moving to this place. Now, okay, now we're engaged, bring down the bombers, and then guiding the bombers in against the targets. The Bobbix being subterranean too is another little bit of a problem. During the um, the comics, during the second invasion of Clendathu, it was a huge problem because the bugs wouldn't stand and fight. They would attack small groups of mobile infantry. Then they'd retreat. They wouldn't start swarming anymore because that was getting less and less effective. And simultaneously, mobile infantry bases on the planets got dodgier and dodgier. That's one of the problems too with actually hosting the bombers on the world. Because of course that would um, increase their area of operation within a theater, but also bind them to that theater since there's no longer, of course, an orbital station for them to return to and a bomb from. But it would allow, presumably, them to carry way more bombs because they wouldn't have to have as much fuel and energy to reach orbit again. And they would also, presumably, be able to hit the target, return, pick up a new bomb lob, and then go out and hit the same target again far more quickly than the whole orbit, resupply, down from orbit again, up to orbit again, so on. But... That's a big strategic target, and the buggies are very difficult to intercept, again, subterranean. There's even a lot of mention about how they can dig out vast areas really, really quickly as well. Not to mention, of course, it's not actually that easy to make an airfield. The airfield itself isn't that hard, you still have to flatten out and pave a pretty massive area, but the command and control infrastructure is even bigger. Particularly for something like those bombers with quite a payload, I imagine they need a fair bit of a runway. I suspect helicopters might actually be quite useful, but mm, actually would they? Uh, the flying arachnids, they're about the size of a warrior, a little bit smaller, so again, maybe two, three hundred kilograms. And the bugs would be happy to trade one of those with a helicopter and would simply ram the damn thing. Yeah, yeah, on second thought, maybe that's not the best idea after all. And finally, too, a note on the whole basis thing, because You'd think that'd be a real strength of the mobile infantry, being able to set up, uh, you know, bases, because they screwed with the arachnids pretty damn hard on Planet P, didn't they? Particularly the big fat 50 cal dishkas mounted in the towers, yes, more of those, obviously. But once again, they burrow, they burrow, the dirty little cheating bastards. I think there was a mention in, um, one of the games, I think that Federation permanent bases had this massive layer of reinforced concrete that they rested on. Now, the bugs could still be able to dig through that if given enough time, but it would take absolute ages and would give the mobile infantry plenty of time to you know, engage in countermeasures. Also the mention of gas warfare as well at one point in... Um, that, that was in uh, the, the, the Traitor of Mars, I believe. That too would be a very valid weapon, gas, obviously, and that'd be particularly great as well against enemies with vast subterranean complexes. Those can be pumped full of all manners of hostile neural agents and other such nonsense, and it's not like we should offer the bugs too much in the way of moral equivalents. <laughs> like, oh, they seem to be engaged in a war of genocidal extermination against us, but we shouldn't use gas, that's just downright unsporting. Hmm. The reason for why they're not using gas early on, I believe, is because they didn't really have the tech to produce it, and they couldn't really come up with something that worked well against the bugs either, because, well, 500 kilogram monsters, I imagine their respiratory system is, uh, not exactly the easiest in the world to screw over. But definitely, again, basis. Bases would be very useful, with even heavier weaponry. If a 762 is useful against a bug, then, you know, a twin-linked 50 cal is definitely gonna do some work. 
And that part I don't even find unbelievable. Yeah, I'd expect them to have a little bit more in the way of mechanized technology in the far future with spaceships, but I cannot for even a single instant think that they could improve upon the perfection that is the 50 cal. <laughs> Unironically, that damn thing will never stop being useful in all your likelihood. Anywho. With that, I will wrap up this um, little commentary video. We've been primarily talking about the weaponry of the mobile infantry here, what they have, what they could have had, what they probably should have had, etc. Because their tactics, mm, again, their tactics are interesting, aren't they? But if you once more view it in a charitable light, taking into mind the abilities of their enemy, I actually do believe that the tactics they display are relatively sensible in relations, again, to the enemy. You want large formations of infantry capable of coordinating as much firepower as possible against an inevitably much larger foe. Wandering around in, you know, groups of 10 or 20 men is not going to work out particularly well when the enemy can attack that with a force of 2,000 and still have plenty of margin of error left as far as force depletement goes. So, with all of that being said, thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. If you are a patron or subscribe star supporter of mine, then the artwork used in this video will also be available for you there. I think it does a good job of representing the mobile infantry in all its robustness. And also introducing a um, fittingly unserious atmosphere. Yes, I believe it does. Until next time, have a good day.